everyone, and welcome to the Hackathon. Um, my name is Rob. You've probably seen me pop up a few times now. I'm just going to bring up Will's screen, I think, but I think Trisha is speaking on the end of it. Um, Will, I've just made you a speaker. You should be able to turn your camera mic on and then magically appear on the stage with me. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Rob. Welcome to the Power Platform School Black Lives Matter Hackathon. <laughs> okay, so basically today is how it's, um, how it's going to run. So we're going to start off with a brief intro just about the background of the Power Platform School who Black Minds Matter are. Um, and then we've actually got two um, talks, one from Mark and another from Anna, but how they got into tech, um, why it's absolutely fantastic, why it's awesome. This is more in mind for our Black Minds Matter mentee, trying to get them, encourage them to the dark side of tech, you know? <laughs> um, and then we're also gonna hand over to um, Will and Chris, um, we all know and love. Um, they're gonna basically just talk about rules of engagement, how to do a successful hack. Then we're gonna hack, this is why we're all here. We're gonna get into it. Um, and then we're going to have some presentations and surprise giving, and then we get to go home feeling absolutely accomplished. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So let's start off with um, just a brief intro to the Power Platform School at Black Minds Matter. So, why the Power Platform School? The Power Platform School is kind of um, geared and introduced um, during a, a, a session. <laughs> with a group of Power Platforms people in, in what we call the Badger Pub. Um, so there's a lot of unrest happening at the moment, especially in terms of um, the black community. And I don't, I'm not going to go into that because we all know what's happening. We've seen the news and I encourage you to read up more about it um, if you haven't. Um, so with that in mind, like and some soul searching, there aren't a lot of black people in tech. The last, in the last um, Nigel Frank survey, there was 4% of black people in tech, in Microsoft um, tech, in, in total, in the UK, right? We want to change that. So how do we actually change this? We change it through providing awareness of this issue. That's the first step. And what we did was we did a, we did a pub quiz, um, I think a month ago now, where we did, we raised funds and we made, we made the awareness that this is something that we're passionate about. Black minds matter, black lives do matter. And with that, we were, we were able to generate not only much needed funds towards different charities, including Black Minds Matter, but we're also able to generate awareness on this issue. Then the next thing that we wanted to do is provide some guidance. We want to provide guidance to um, the Black community to show them that tech is something that they can get into. It allows them to escape from different issues that they might actually be facing. Um, and also encourage them to basically provide those opportunities that they might not know that exist, right? So there's apprenticeship schemes available, internships available, but how do you actually get engaged in them? How do you actually join them? So we want to be able to surface these opportunities and provide these opportunities to black communities and then increase the visibility of black people in tech so that other people are actually then encouraged to step forward and actually see this as a viable career um, for them. So this is actually the aim of the Power Platform School and um, this is the first iteration of what we hope to be a, a constant running um, thing um, in partnership with Black Minds Matter. So I really want to thank Nali who's actually here. Um, <laughs> So I'm gonna like step right here. Yeah, yeah, two weeks apart. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanna thank Malik. Um, so we reached out to Malik um, and I basically explained what we wanted to do and with his help, his support, we were able to pull together this school, um, which basically took um, which basically allowed us to create this many sessions with this with eight different um, people from the um, from the Black Minds Matter community, and pretty much it's really because of you that we're actually here today. So I really want to take this oh, opportunity to thank you very very much. Thank you. Um, and I really hope that you know we've done you proud, and we're actually able to do some of this as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> so what we've done with the school, right? 
just just to let you know what we've actually been doing this month. Um, the we have eight different participants that have actually made, made up the school, and we've actually done a lot of um, sessions, lots of workshops, right? Um, we they've done app of the day, power automate of the day, power app of the day, it's got change management, etc. So we've had eight um, eight participants with mentors, with trainers in one month. It's a lot of information. Today is the day that they're going to be able to put all of this together and create some beautiful solutions with people in the community. Um, so I really want to take this opportunity as well before I hand back to the trainers who are involved this month. Um, we have pretty much all the big names in the UK community and even abroad as well um, that have taken time out of their, their schedule to, to train. Um, our participants and also we have the different mentors which are still mentoring um, our participants and will continue to mentor our participants and I really want to take the opportunity to thank them as well. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us this um, Saturday morning. It's really great um, to see so many people involved. I would love to have something like this, perhaps when I was a little bit earlier on in my career. Um, it's really nice to see everyone come together in this way. It's really nice to see the support um, from our colleagues here internally at Microsoft and from our partners in the ecosystem in the world. Um, my name is Marco. And most people refer to me as that guy Marco, just because we have quite a few marks at Microsoft and quite a few marks with um, O's as a surname. On social media you can find me with the same tag at that guy Marco and I'm currently working at Microsoft as a partner technical architect. So of course I'm in the Power Platform world which is amazing and I get to work with our amazing partners some of whom have helped put um, together today's hackathon really around helping them on everything to do with our Power Platform, its awesomeness how they can create um, business value out of this, how they can help our customers, which is a big deal. Hopefully for the next, I think I've got maybe 20 minutes or I've got a little bit longer. I was just gonna share with you my, my personal journey, why I, why I got into tech, what it means to me. Um, hopefully perhaps so it can uh, help inspire and drive some ideas with you. Uh, I'm not sure if we do have time for questions, but if, if we are able to take any Q&As or if anybody wants to ask me any questions, uh, just use the Q&A chat. In the meantime, if you can't get to a mic to talk and I'll try and answer them as I go along. So I'm not gonna talk, talk for too long because I feel like you might get some more value just asking me some questions and I can then hopefully then just answer back to those questions. Um, for me, uh, the big one, I guess, is why I got into to tech and I appreciate this might be recorded, but the team know I'm super, super honest and perhaps maybe not the most PC, but um, I had a choice. I probably am your typical stereotype. So, or I would have said I was seen as your typical stereotype. And by that, I mean um, a statistic or a number. So I come originally from South London, um, Brixton, Council Estate. Um, so naturally, uh, if you were to look at my, on a piece of paper as a black male, my statistics aren't the highest um, in terms of what I could do, in terms of uh, some of the things I could accomplish. Um, and I had a bit of a crossroad when I was in school. Uh, naturally, everyone around me was doing one thing and was doing pretty well. And I was perhaps saying, mm, I don't necessarily want to do that thing, be it selling drugs, be it music, or be it football, which is quite popular or quite common for um, people from a BAME community, so Black, Asian, minorities, um, generally because of some of the challenges we don't always get access to. But um, I was very, 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 very blessed and fortunate that at the time 
they had university opportunities for those who wanted to go to um, university, those especially who wanted to learn IT. So at the time I went to um, university, they, there was a big focus on IT. The government realized it was the way forward. They realized IT was gonna change us, um, not only from a, a, an opportunity point of view, but also from a social economic point of view. So by that, I mean, helping take you out of your situation. And that's what I really, really, really connected with. So again, for me, it was this crossroad between, do I go and do drugs? Do I go and do football? And by do drugs, I don't mean physically taking drugs. <laughs> I mean, more like selling it. Uh, and at that time, as you can imagine, being in a council estate, seeing people who did sell drugs with the amounts of money they had was a lot more attractive than, say, um, the dude in a suit who was walking in the rain, struggling to get to work or struggling to make his way forward. Um, and then I saw IT, which was this middle ground, this, this, this way of um, opening new doors, um, this new way about improving the situation. So I kind of went through that path. I said, everybody does the other stuff, let me try my hand at uh, IT. And I was very, 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 like I said, blessed in that extent that at the time they were giving us a lot of opportunities to go and do IT. So I went, I was, I was, I was lucky enough to get in, onto university where I studied a business IT course. I wasn't quite sure if I was going to fully go into IT or if I was going to go into business. So we had the idea back then of these joint courses and um, what really helped me back then, which this kind of reminds me of, which is why I'm so desperate to be part of this and support this, was they had Saturday classes. So if you were trying to get into IT, um, but you didn't have a computer or you didn't have the facilities at home, you could go down to um, this community center, youth center, and that's where you could go to do something similar to what we're doing now. Um, virtual classes, um, work with people who did understand IT to give you a bit of a leg up. And that really, really, really helped me um, and it pushed me further into IT. So that, that why did I get into IT for me then became um, not only to improve my um, social economic circumstances. So by that, I mean, to help me get out of the, the, the estate, to help me get out of the hood, to help me get out of that mentality. But it also then began to introduce me to interesting people. So uh, I began to meet people from diverse backgrounds, people from different countries, from different walks of life. And I started to love IT even more because um, if you don't mind me saying back then, for me anyway, a lot of the other areas or careers felt quite specialist. They felt quite um, elitist. They felt quite um, boys club. Whereas IT kind of felt like you could just be yourself. You could um, come as you were. Um, I felt as though most techies were the same as me, very down to earth, very easy to catch up with, very easy to talk with. Um, and I just gelled with it even more. And hopefully today's a, a brilliant example of that, where we have different people from different walks of life, males, females, young, old, um, joining in. Because for me, that was the cool thing about technology and IT. So I use that um, inspiration and that motivation to carry on. And it really helped change my mindset. It really helped me to understand um, there's a lot more to the world than just um, what I'd known before in my estate and in my small uh, council, council life. And it made me push even further into IT. And I started um, near the bottom. So when I say near the bottom, I mean, I really worked my way all the way to the top and I started in support. Everyone said to me back then, if you really want to understand IT, if you really want to get into IT, it's almost the equivalent of working in retail. You've got to work on the shop floor. So in our example in IT, it was you've got to work in customer service. You've got to work on a support desk. Learn how to deal with people who are upset because things are not working. Learn how to train your brain to be a problem-solving brain, a much more uh, methodical thinking brain. Go and start in um, support. And I did. And um, if I'm honest with you, I hated the first six months. It was brutal. It was customers telling you um, your software application was sugar honey iced tea. It was customers complaining they were missold. So by missold, perhaps the company had sold them in this platform that was going to do bells and whistles. And actually, it just did um, the opposite. But it gave me an amazing set of experience um, talking with customers, talking with partners, if partners were involved and involved but actually just learning the process of what it felt like to be in IT from that point of view. And I did that for maybe 18 months to two, two hard years, I'd say almost. 
and it was covering everything. So when I went into support, I really wanted to learn as much as I could. So I tried to go for one of those really generic um, support um, fields that allowed me to touch everything. And I felt like that really helped springboard me. But naturally, um, it was difficult. It was a time when perhaps there wasn't many diversity or much diversity in IT. It was a time perhaps when the IT culture itself was still growing and getting used to some um, changes, but I still loved it. I felt like it was absolutely great. Um, it supported my first to learn. It supported my first to want to develop. And like I said, I was meeting some really, really great and awesome people as part of this. Um, and my journey continued. Um, I was lucky enough to get to then do the, the opportunity of presenting. A lot of people found my um, presenting style quite different, quite niche. As I said, I'm not the very, um, I'm not the most PC, so political correct person at times. This has improved. <laughs> but I always, always got the opportunity to present. And through presenting, I found a new passion, which is helping people understand how technology can change their life understanding how technology can improve their circumstances. So I initially joined IT um, or the IT world to help feel that for myself. And then when I began to feel that for myself, that, that whole idea of can I use IT to change my social um, economic background? Can I use IT to grow myself culturally and create some diversity? Something I never had before, just being in this uh, single council estate and only seeing this one view and this one vision of thing. So then saying, well, how can I use technology in a way to help others um, in the same way I have? And that's generally how I look at my customers um, or partners I get to work with. It's uh, how can I give them the same passion I have around um, technology? So right now it's the power platform and everything awesome around that. Um, to how can they leverage it to help them? And some of that's what then led me to Microsoft and uh, Microsoft's culture. In, in respect to Microsoft's always trying to get others to achieve more through what it does, uh, help others to do more through the platforms it provided. Um, so when I was lucky enough to land in Microsoft, it was a perfect fit for me then, still is now, um, both from a cultural point of view and also from a what we can do with technology. Um, but again, I felt that same sort of uh, lull or that same sort of loneliness uh, when I first joined Microsoft, it was also going through its cultural journey. So again, there wasn't that many um, BAME people. Uh, we heard from a speaker early on, that's something we're really trying to change, we're really trying to invigorate. Um, but it was an amazing journey. I've been part of that journey to help um, get more people into to IT, to understand how different it is, um, to help people understand some of the opportunities it can create. And I've been there now at Microsoft, coming up to six years almost, and it's been amazing. My technology journey has seen me working in different parts of Microsoft, so I can really understand the engine, the mothership, the beast that is um, Microsoft, but also trying to understand a bit more about its culture and how I can bring um, the BAME community into its culture and help them also understand. Um, so for me, I see education as being this big um, silver bullet, if I use that word to help us tackle some of the world's challenges, um, especially perhaps around racism. So when I first started Microsoft, it was um, very different for a lot of my colleagues who perhaps hadn't seen um, people from an ethnic background working in IT. Um, and although it was difficult, I loved the fact it was a challenge to show them that actually, yes, um, people from ethnic minority backgrounds or even backgrounds of um, social economic disparity. So naturally back then, um, in the old, old world, it was a certain type of person that worked in Microsoft, whereas now it's a lot more different. But I, I was I was always grateful to be part of that change in culture, helping the, the, the company locally. Um, I work in our UK London team to understand, yeah, we can have some people from different walks of life. Um, and actually diversity helps our culture. It helps what we do in IT, it helps uh, remove biases, uh, biases in things like uh, AI, which is quite um, popular and trending right now. Uh, how important it is for us as perhaps ethnic minorities to be able to contribute to AI, because actually AI is going to be used a lot in what we do. I remember when I first um, worked at Microsoft and the um, 
Face ID, which is the Microsoft version, um, the Apple version, and internally, um, ours is called Windows Hello. That looks at your face and allows you to log in. I remember before seeing my colleagues log in and it worked, boom, first time round. And people used to laugh at me and say, why are you always typing to log in? You can just use your face now. And I remember saying, oh, it doesn't quite work just yet on my skin tone. We're getting there though, and we're getting there. As opposed to today, it does it even quicker than some of my um, colleagues from different backgrounds. And I remember that only being possible because of having that diversity in the teams that work at Microsoft and having people at Microsoft and technology in general just to stand up on perhaps uh, ethnic minority backgrounds behalf to say, hey, uh, by the way, um, this doesn't quite work right for us or can we be part of this to maybe help improve this? Um, and this is for me is really what I love about technology that the idea of the, the diversity it brings the idea of that diversity supports innovation, but more importantly then um, the education it provides behind it. Um, and I talk about technology the very same way um, my friends talk about the music industry in that, yes, the music industry is great for if you want to be a, um, a singer or a rapper or a songwriter, but if you peel back that, that initial um, target or popular roles that people normally go for, there are so many other roles behind that that perhaps are not related to that specific specific talent. You have your marketing, you have your managers, your program teams, your tour managers, your um, operations team. And that's how I kind of see IT. So normally, um, yes, from a BAME perspective, you usually see people think, oh, no, I'm not really a coder, or I'm not really a dev person, or actually, um, I don't think IT is for me. And I try to challenge that to say, well, IT has so many different layers. It may be hardware you're into. It may be um, the marketing side. And by hardware, I mean devices. So it could be laptops. It could be, uh, in our case at Microsoft, we have HoloLens, we have Surface, we have phones. It may be, from another extent, the Xbox part of the world. It may be our marketing team. It may be actually you just want to work in education and change how um, things are being done in education. So that was also another area quite close close to my heart. But I tell people um, IT has layers. So don't just naturally think you can be a developer or you want to be a developer and that's the only route for you. Um, there are so many different areas. And as our platform changes, you can see um, these special, um, I call them super gurus, super wizards, these dev dev people, they have their own place. And that will never change. We always need devs. I always see them as our workhorses to make things a lot simpler for us. But there are so many different avenues you can get into IT and use IT to work from. And actually the platforms themselves, as our devs are getting so, um, so smart, they're actually creating really cool ways to make it easier for people like ourselves who are non-devs to use the platform. So you may hear people refer to this as um, democratizing the platform. And I'll use AI as an example. You would previously have to have a, a, a almost a deep science background or a, an AI science background to be able to write your own machine learning models and implement them and train them so that they could be used in a particular scenario. Whereas as we've seen at the Power Platform and with things like AI Builder, that's been made a lot simpler to allow people who have really great ideas or who have a dream or an innovation to change something to jump on and get working super quick. Um, and for me, that was the other bit I really liked about IT, which was um, how it reduced those barriers to entry for people like myself from different backgrounds um, to come in and learn something new and take that and do something really amazing or really awesome with. I'm going to pause for a few minutes just in case if there's any questions coming in in the chat or if anybody uh, wants to ask a question of me. Like I said, I'm very open to questions, so please don't be shy. Um, I try to answer them as transparently or as honest as I can. Okay, so um, one of the questions that's come through is how long was your interview process? I heard it takes a long time to get a job at Microsoft. Um, if I'm honest with you, and this may be, again, a, a bit of a, a BAME thing. I've always suffered, or not suffered, because I think it's a good thing for the learning, but I've always um, had loads of interview processes. So even that first support job I had was four interviews. 
And um, I've naturally found for BAME communities that's quite common. And that's just, you know, to see if you're serious, to make sure you're, 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 you're committed, but also to really tease out some of the amazing qualities. You may um, have had challenges getting out perhaps in the first two rounds. So they want to give you a second or maybe third try to give an opportunity to bring it out in, say, a, a, another attempt. So for me, my first role, it was four interviews. At Microsoft, it was five. Um, and it was five, like I said, because it was early in early in this cultural journey of Microsoft. It was when we just had this new um, CEO, Satya Nadella, and he had changed the view of the world to say, actually, at Microsoft, we want people, first of all, who have the mindset and the culture. And that mindset and that culture is similar to the one I spoke about earlier, but he just gave it more of a framework, which was around being able to learn fast and not being afraid to fail. Um, and then the idea being you learn from your failure. So at Microsoft at that time, because they were trying this new thing out, which meant you didn't specifically have to be a coder or a deep techie. They just wanted you to have a particular set of um, culture or a set of mentality. You would have five interviews. Um, you'd have your first telephone screening interview. You would then have an internal telephone interview. So that first one would generally be an external um, in, uh, telephone screening. Then you have an internal one, perhaps with the internal uh, managers uh, looking at that role. They will then generally bring you in to Microsoft to say, well, now we want you to have a face-to-face -face or an in-person presentation, which would be what we call your third round. Uh, for us now during COVID, it will probably be more virtual. Um, and then after you have um, your business presentation, naturally they will give you a technical presentation. So my first role into Microsoft was into the, dynamic, the, the Dynamics team. So I was asked um, just to present on Dynamics um, they give you a scenario, perhaps, or they ask you to bring your own scenario. And I presented that scenario, and that was probably then my third stage. But in my example, because the team was so brand new, um, the actual director of the team also wanted to meet the interviewees internally also. So I had the opportunity to do another two more interviews um, so I could meet him. And then I was quite blessed that he was um, so blown away by what his team were doing in terms of hiring people like myself that he asked me then to interview to his senior leadership team to show actually how, in this example, diversity and um, hiring outside their normal guidelines can actually work. So um, uh, Pierre, in that example, it was five. For some people, it can be four. Uh, for many people, it can be three, um, which I hope answers your questions. But it's really down to you. Things have changed so much then, obviously now even more so with COVID. Um, but I normally say, around three or four is about the average. Um, I have another question um, around how have you found other folks respond to your openness <laughs> around these subjects? Um, it's great right now with everything going on in the world, everybody has really, really opened their mind to want to listen and understand, which is a very different place to be in as opposed to trying to get people's attention or get your voice across. So internally at Microsoft, um, colleagues, allies, um, partners have been amazing. Um, a lot of people I'm lucky enough um, know what I'm like anyway. So they're very used to my, 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 honest, my honesty, my candidness. Um, it does take a while. But if I'm honest, I think people generally warm to it and they appreciate how honest I am. They generally like the candidness. Um, I've learned to tone it down, not to scare people too much. So with these subjects, yeah, I'd say people are quite open, they're quite receptive and they're quite welcoming and also quite conversational. I've also found people are very happy um, to talk back to me to hear more about these particular subjects, be it my journey, be it how I got to where I got to or be it the challenges I'm going through. Um, I can see another one here. Uh, if you could talk to the Mark before the interview for the support job, what advice would you give him now, knowing what you do know? Um, it would be that failed, that would be that, um, that, that whole mantra around um, learning and failing, um, and failure being part of the learning process. So when I first going through uni, going through education, you're always taught that you've got to pass first time around, you've got to, you've got to nail it, you've got to execute. Um, and then as I moved into to, to roles, as I went on to my career, I started to learn. Uh, learning is part of it, but you can never be a know-it-all. So at Microsoft, uh, we have this terminology called a learn-it-all because you're, you should always be constantly learning. Um, 
So in that example, my advice there would, would be to not care so much about what I don't know and take the opportunities so that you can learn and not be afraid to fail. Because back then I was so scared around failing, I thought I'd lose my role. Um, I suffered loads from what they call um, imposter syndrome. So perhaps being the only black person or the person from a BAME group, ethnic group working in one of these places, feeling like if I fail, they're gonna be like, yeah, see, that's why we don't want these people here. You proved our point. So I had a lot of um, social conscious biases from that extent. And then I learned to just be open about it sometimes. Yes, I can't do this, or I am gonna fail at this, but what am I gonna learn from this that's gonna help me? So that would be my advice. It would be what I know now, which is don't be a know-it-all, be a learn-it-all, and don't be afraid to fail because fail is part of the learning. So learn fast, fail, so you can press on. Um, I guess Rob's question, which is the one straight after that's uh, slightly um, similar to that, which is, is there a piece of advice you, you wish you got 10 years ago? It would be that, <laughs> is um, just, just give it a go. Apply for the job, try the job. If it doesn't work out, you will learn. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very programmatic in that sense. Um, to give you a much more personal example, I was lucky enough to recently join um, everybody else and be a proper adult, and I now own my own place. And for years, it was something uh, I never wanted to do. I was quite shy. Uh, I drove past the place, it was being built from scratch, and just randomly I said to, to the guys building it, um, how when is it going to be finished, is there a number I could reach out to to speak to somebody about the pricing, I uh, spoke to the person on the phone, and I just randomly gave an amount, so with houses, if, uh, for many of you who may be familiar, <coughs> you'll bid an amount to say, I don't know, the house is going for 600, you'll give them 600 on the door, or maybe you might be cheeky and offer them 550 as another example. And it's a bit of a bid and war process. At the time, I, I didn't have a mortgage. I didn't have any money saved up. I wasn't even sure what I was doing. I saw the place. I saw a picture of what it looks like when it's going to be built. And I just gave them a call and I said, would you accept it for X amount? And if I'm honest with you, it was probably um, tens of thousands of pounds less than what they'd asked for. And straight away, they were like, yeah, sure, come down, um, let's have a chat. And for me, that's when I really, really uh, appreciated that whole idea of you just got to try. Uh, I wasn't ready to buy a place. Of course, I started panicking. I started running around, seeing how much money I could get together, seeing how long it would take me to get the money. But I give you that example because it's what I kind of now apply to everything I do, which is just try. Um, you just you don't know unless you don't try. So Rob, that, that piece of advice that I wish I had before is um, probably the best one I, I live to now. Um, if I put it in much more famous words, uh, Michael Jordan, NBA basketballer said, you miss 100% of the shots um, you don't take. So at least if I take it, at least something might work out right for me. But if I don't take it, I know 100% what my outcome is going to be. Um, Samuel's got another question. He's just asked, does Microsoft provide opportunities or training for people that didn't make the right decision from BAME backgrounds and now have convictions, etc.? And if so, is there any way to get involved? Um, this is where Microsoft is amazing, but at the same time, not so amazing. We're not very good at talking about some of the stuff we do from a social responsibility point of view, from a, um, uh, a charity point of view, NGO point of view but we have a lot of initiatives to support different people from different backgrounds. So not just the BAME community, we have ER uh, employee resource groups, so almost called um, uh, groups you can join around um, uh, Gileam. So people who may be, um, who ha may have their own sexual preferences. We have uh, accessibility groups to empower those who may have accessibility challenges. We have groups for veterans so veterans are people who have gone to defend our country as part of um, our, our military forces who have been in places of war-torn conflict and now perhaps don't even know how to adjust back. And we have systems to support these people. Likewise, um, systems to support perhaps people who may have made the wrong decision. So the short answer of that is yes, there are different types of ways Microsoft supports some of these groups that you can come into and they can help you. Uh, we have mentor groups that work internally and externally. Um, we work with partners who do a, a much more greater job at this work than we do. So I'd, again, I would say do not let your previous decisions, convictions, 
uh, previous ways of work stop you, have a go. Now, Microsoft do have these things to support you. Uh, perhaps before the end of the day, I'll drop a link into where you can get some more information. And um, this goes to our interns as well. So people who perhaps didn't pick university as an option, but perhaps wish they did. We have programs to help you as well. So it may be now you're looking at university or now you want to get into work. There are also some to support you there. Um, I'm going to go to Will because he's got some questions in the room too. So yeah, so uh, if you have a question, please just uh... Like how they, so say like the environment, if people incorporate what they've learned at Microsoft into sort of in sustainability, handling climate change and stuff, have they ever used what they've learned at Microsoft in? To, to change the world positive. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so have they used the skill set that they've applied there to actually move forward and actually help other issues? Yeah. Like yeah. Um, that is what makes Microsoft so great. It's got a bunch yes. of people like that. So um, as an example to this, um, Chris Huntingford um, brought me into this initiative. So um, Chris, is not, Chris, this is something that's close to his heart. And he said, hey, I'm, I'm working with my external group, um, you know, Will, Rob, this is what we do. This is what we're passionate about. We want to take what we do internally and create something externally to help support. So even just this Black Minds Matter, digital hack hacker form from a, a Chris and I point of view. So, you know, Chris looked me and he said, hey, mate, do you want to be part of this? This is one example of some of that that goes on. Um, I, for my sins, worked in the account team. So I say sins because a lot of people look at the account teams as where all the um, selling and the negative stuff happens. But I was in the public sector team um, because I wanted to help public sector organizations. So I was lucky enough to help support um, schools, education, but it gave me an opportunity to leverage Microsoft programs to help schools. So we do things like Digital Girls coding for um, uh, females and girls who are who are not necessarily representing at IT and who need a jump up to get them into IT. We have a BAME ERG group, so an employee resource group at Microsoft that, I, that people can join. And you can go and give in your expertise, your time, your ideas to help support some of the initiatives the BAME community may be doing. Uh, I was lucky enough two years ago, or last year actually, to be able to mentor um, adult BAME people who are working with um, the job centre. So these are people trying to get back into work. And I took my Microsoft content and I, I ran some digital literacy. Let me help you uh, to the question that was asked earlier on. Um, by um, somebody, oh, by Samuel, let me help you understand how to write an email. Let me help you understand how to get a LinkedIn profile, uh, how to send emails. So not, um, uh, as an example, Mr. Run You Down at hotmail.com, but yes, Mr. Uh, Michael.yoursurname at hotmail.com. So we, we were able to run some initiatives externally and internally using Microsoft um, resources to mentor and help those people get back into work, provide some digital literacy skills. Um, from a sustainability point of view, we have internal people who, for example, were the side at Microsoft said, well, we talk about sustainability, but we don't do much recycling here ourselves. Let's get some recycling bins set up in the office. Um, I gave you the example of Windows Hello which um, by no fault of Microsoft, but you know, naturally when it was designed, it only had a particular audience in mind. So we had people come in and say, no, 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 this doesn't work for BAME people. This doesn't work for um, people from Asian or black minorities because there's some differences in And Microsoft will say, well, help us understand those differences. So yes, there are so many opportunities. Microsoft um, implores people who want to try to do that. Like we have promoting some of the good work we're doing in places like Africa. So internally, we have the opportunity to kind of go and travel and work in Africa. We have the opportunity to go and travel and work in Eastern Europe and um, Western Europe, where they also have some challenges. I hope that helps answer your question. Yeah, thank you. Will, did you have any other questions from the room? Yeah, I think that's all from the rumor side, uh, Marcus. Thank you. No problem. Um, I, 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 that should be all. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think I was coming up to time, but I guess the, 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 the thing I just wanted to finish on is just to, to put, really push how technology can change um, our ways of life, both from a, a cultural point of view, from a diversity point of view, 
from a social economic point of view, but also just giving you the, op the opportunity to also touch others. So when everybody says to me why I got into tech, how I got into tech, the how was because I didn't want to go down one particular route and I felt like tech would help me understand the other routes. Um, the why and why I'm still here is because of the, the impact I feel technology has and how I see it as being so key to changing and being part of some of the social issues we have, um, racial issues we have, and then economic issues we have. Um, and I say that because it allows us to, to, to see these challenges in new different ways and to address them in ways we never thought were possible before. My name is Marco Biro, more formally that guy Marco. Thank you so much for your time and listening to me and I hope my story helped. Thank you so much, Mark. I think you can hear from the room here and I'm sure all around remotely as well, there's claps and boards and a bit of laughter, a bit of happiness along the way as well. Uh, so, we're on now. We're going to, uh, if I can get this uh, gadget to work, meant to be good at technology. Let's give it a go. There you go. So, we're going to hand you over to Chris Huntingford now, uh, who's going to work uh, through how to have a successful hackathon. Now, I'm putting Chris on the spot here because it was meant to be me going through it with him, but as we're remote, I'll take on the next set of slides and he can do this one. So, Chris, enjoy the on the spot. Woo, Chris, Chris! <laughs> Chris. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is just going to get weird. Hang on, let me fix my lights. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so successful hack. First of all, uh, Mark O, dude, it, it got really weird in my room on my own. I'm sitting there and I'm like, yeah! I'm like, hang on, I'm on my own. <laughs> so, yeah, that was that, that got straight. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, first of all, big shout out to Trisha and Mark O for, for uh, presenting before me. That is, that is literally the hardest thing to follow. Like, I literally can say nothing that is going to top any of that. So I'm just going to have to try and go into, like, full-on nerd mode, and hopefully you'll, uh, you'll kind of get the idea here. But we've done a number of these hacks before, and I know for some of you this is fairly new. I looked at the participant list, and I'd really like to say thank you to everyone who's taken their time out on this Saturday to come and hang out. It's never, it's never an easy thing to do, and a lot of people think, oh, a Saturday hackathon, how exciting can that be? But based on the noise being made where you are and I'm not, I'm kind of like, I've got lots of uh, envious, so I'm super jealous. So um, yeah, we're going to talk about what makes a successful hack. Now, you know, when we started doing this um, in the very beginning, a number of years ago, I got to, you know, we got to, we got to set up these hackathons. So Will, Kyle and I decided that, well, you know, one of the first things we wanted to do with the Power Platform was to try and bring people together through technology and, and hackathons seemed like the, the most fun thing to do. One, we didn't realize just how much work it was in the very beginning. Now we kind of get it. And two, we didn't realize how easy it was to bring people together this way. So one of the things we focused on there is really, you know, creating this inclusive community of folks. And um, I'd like to say, you know, based on the questions in the chat and everything, please always feel free to join us, feel free to bring friends, if you know everything or you know nothing, or you just want to learn, like Mark, Marco said, have a learn it all attitude, that's what this is all about. Do not be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to research. This is your opportunity to play with the <coughs> bricks you would never have played with before. Okay, so what makes a successful hack? Well, uh, well, if you just want to animate the first slide, the first thing in a successful hack is teamwork, okay? A successful hack, you could be building anything. So. Um, Many moons ago, we ran a Lego hackathon, right? So we got to, uh, we got people to basically build out bits and pieces of uh, little Lego structures based on a, you know, a, an idea that they had. But what we figured was that it was going to be interesting to see how people were going to build these things. And it was quite interesting to see that a lot of people kind of went off on their own and created their own thing. And a lot of people... <laughs> and um, decided what they were going to do was say, well, you build this, you build this, you build this. So one of the most important things is teamwork. No hackathon works properly without teamwork, okay? I promise, you may think this will work on your own. It will not, okay? So the teamwork piece and the collaborative piece is really key. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Will, but every single team that has won one of these hackathons has always been a team with a brilliant, brilliant team structure and project management. 
Absolutely, you can't do it without that. Otherwise, you'll run around like headless chickens. You build something, but at the same time, nothing. Exactly. So, I mean, we we call it we call it high noise, low value, right? So you're making lots of noise and doing lots of stuff, but nothing's really actually happening. Um, the next thing we have is planning. Now, you don't have a long time to build this stuff. Okay, you really don't. So, I would say spend more time planning than anything else. If you spend, I promise you now, if you spend two hours planning and the rest of the time building, you might find that you have actually something better to build, to work with. Building something that's not understood is not going to work for you. So come to a cohesive plan together, work together to decide what to create. I promise you now, less is more. Okay. So if you're just going to dive in and you're going to be like, Hey, I'm going to build myself a box and that box is going to do virtual agency type stuff. That doesn't help. You know, when you're speaking to Malik, Malik's got a certain set of problems or problem statements that, uh, you know, the, the BMM team would like to solve and um, randomly building stuff isn't going to cut the mustard, right? So what I would say is plan, run your ideas past people. If you need to talk to Malik or Trisha or myself or Will, you know, just reach out um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll be able to tell you if this is a terrible idea or not. You know, we're pretty straightforward with that type of thing. But um, like I said, planning is key. The next thing is have roles. It is not going to work if everyone builds a power virtual agent. It's not going to work if everyone builds a canvas app. So pick roles in the team. Now, what I like to say to people is that, you know, one of the key things to success here is having somebody that manages the project. You will laugh, but I promise you, the team that won the first ever hackathon, their solution was not massive. It was very straightforward. It was what we call like a point solution but their project management was on point, right? They made sure that everything they built was kind of managed by that person. Uh, that person took them through a process. That person had, you know, task management and said, have you done this? Have you done that? The other thing is that, you know, a role in the team, without kidding, could be building out a PowerPoint deck, okay? A role in the team could be building the presentation. It's up to you. There is a space here for everyone. So if you're not technical and you want to learn the tech, that's the, this is the right time to do it. This is the right time to mess around. The next thing that's really key around the roles piece, and this always impresses me. Um, well, do you want me to quickly cover the presentation bit now? You, you do what you want, my friend. <laughs> so go for it. Cool. So um, one thing that's really key is in the role section, at the end of this, you're going to be doing a five-minute presentation. Okay, five minutes. That's how you're going to tell people how awesome your solution is. Now, one thing that's really important is I'm always very impressed to see what people do in five minutes. Some people present their technical solutions. Some people just stay on slides. I can promise you the quicker you get into the thing you've actually built to show people the Lego bricks that you used to make the all the digital bricks you used to make the awesome solution rather than showing a million slides. The judges will want to see something real. OK, one of the roles will be to focus on that presentation. It's really important that you do it. The other thing is with the teamwork piece, one person presenting doesn't really work super well, okay? It's always good if you bring as many people into the presentation as possible because that will show you teamwork. And then finally, have, a, have an absolute party, right? Enjoy yourself. This is a Saturday. This is not a formal thing, right? If you want to run around like crazy people, go right ahead and do it. If you gain your creative, uh, your creative juices from, I don't know, painting the wall or harassing will go right ahead you know feel free to do anything you need to to make sure that you have a good time all right now what we've done before is we just think out the box we don't think you know okay well we're gonna you know just sit behind a desk and build and build something we make sure we collaborate and communicate we're all trying to be friends here okay this is the best part there are so many new people in this hack that you haven't met make friends in the platform that cloud thing have um, so kindly provided so thanks for that rob um Go and click on different tables. Go and ask people things. Go and get advice. Navigate around the platform to try and understand what's going on and who's building what. And if people want to share, they will, right? So please just keep this collaborative and have a good time. So, Will, is there anything I missed out there? No, I think the only other thing I'd like to call out is, you know, you've obviously been on this for about, about a month doing the learning the power platform tool set. And we, we're not, you know, so, so you go, now you're going to build everything. You've got something 
absolute geniuses in your team from all around the world that are doing up their time, you know, from Microsoft and other partners. It's phenomenal. So really, you're gonna, they're going to learn a lot from you. You're going to learn a lot from them today as well. So when you get to your role side, remember, you're not alone. You've got some really fantastic people around you. Unless like, you've landed with me, then yeah, you might as well give up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a plan. Chris, anything else, buddy? No, that's it, man. I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining this. It's hugely appreciated. Fantastic. So we get to uh, the exciting part. We've we've gone through why we're here. We've heard some fantastic stories of how people have got into their technology. We've learned how to do a successful hackathon. Now it's got to the point where, well, Will, what are we building? So Malik, uh, Trisha, and others have got together and got some really good ideas. And these aren't just ideas they went, oh, I don't think we can do this, but based on nothing. These are ideas that have come from the community, that have come from real world issues. A lot that uh, Black Minds Matter have issues with in regards to uh, feedback they get from communities and other aspects. Malik, is there anything you want to comment on that? Not yet. Not yet. Good. Okay. <laughs> Doing well so far. When he joins it, you know I'm on the wrong road. Okay, so let's make a start. So the first item that, uh, the first idea we've got, and the first solution that you could build, remember there's a few, you might want to combine some together, you might want to build them separately, is a mental health application. So let's quickly look at this quote here from mind.org. Black men are far more likely than others to be diagnosed with severe mental health problems, and are also far more likely to be sectioned under the mental health act. However, up until 11 years old, black boys don't have a poorer mental health than others of their age. So really, how can we address this? And actually, up until the age of 11, it's going perfectly fine. It's only after that that it starts to go downhill. That's really worrying, but there is stuff we can do. So let's look at this. Mental health is absolutely pivotal in a person's success, okay? If you're feeling good, you're happy, then you want to go off and be happy and try and motivate yourself further to do things. Poor mental health can lead to huge setbacks. If you're feeling depressed, you may not want to get up in the morning, you may not want to go there and do things. Early intervention and prevention is pivotal. What if we knew that we were feeling a bit down when we were young, and we actually could go somewhere, talk about it, and know a response, actually it's okay to feel down occasionally. The best thing to do is to pick yourself up, go for a walk, go see the sun, go do all the cool stuff that makes us happy. Everyone gets happiness out of different places. I won't go into what makes me happy, but I'm sure we all have our own. Uh, so what if we had an application that could help individuals monitor their mental health? So their emotions, if they're feeling anxious, if they're feeling angry, if they're feeling upset, if they're feeling elated, but they're not sure why, what if they could go in and actually track what's going on? Also track your stress levels and maybe fitness and other integral parts of what makes your emotions go up and down. You know, that can be impacts on what you're eating, where you're studying, how many hours you're working. All of these are influences on your overall mental health. Now, really, what we could have is a way to track it, a bit like this app here, which is if you look at these links, uh, good, uh, goodthinking.uk or slash anxious, they've done an app that's very similar. Obviously, we're gonna have to have a different twist to make sure it relates to your audience. Very key here, remember your audience at all points. But you get the answer of tracking this and actually doing recommendations and possibly even escalations. There's a young kid being a bit suicidal, maybe we should have the ability to raise the parents when we reach a certain threshold. You know, you want to have that security, that independence, but when it gets to a certain point that maybe for the last two, three days it's been really, really negative, maybe there should be an escalation. We bet the answers in the power platform. Now, Trisha asked me to put this link here, which is uh, bit.ly forward slash mental health BMM. And what this is, is actually a, a power app we built a long time ago for a full line, actually, which is just a proof of concept using a bit of AI. It's relatively easy to do. It's, there's a bit of a walk through the tech behind it, but it shows you how you can actually read people's faces and get their emotions and also see the sentiment of diary entries. Uh, I won't go on too much about that because the video is there and you'll have to hear my voice again. So I'll go give you a bit of a minute off. Um, Max, is there anything you'd like to add to this point? I'd just to add about remember the audience. Yeah, we're specifically focusing on young BME young people. It's a big cultural adaption because there's a lot of apps around the place, but the people who are using the apps around the place, they're, they're BME young people don't use it. So just keep your audience in mind. So cultural adaption, the way the app looks, stuff on the app, just keep in mind your audience. Absolutely. I remember Malik will be around, so if you do want further information on any of these apps or, or ideas, solutions, then you know, go to some of the subject matter experts here. So the next one is the communication outreach solution. So really, what we have at the moment is, and this is a startling statistic, 
a fifth of young people in the UK has been bullied in the past 12 months. So one in five people within any school, any sort of young popular is being bullied. That's huge. Okay, so we think about this. Young people within school, schooling systems and wider systems, remember your environment, any environment you're in is still a system. When you're actually out in various uh, estates, housing, uh, wherever you are, that is still a system and there's still bullying going on. But it goes further than that. What if these young people are experiencing poverty? What if they're having family issues? Maybe their mum's left them, their dad's left the family, whatever it may be, and something's going on and they're not sure what to do about that. At the same time, the people who are taking care of them, maybe the ones that are abusing them, or it may be someone outside of that family environment that's abusing them. However, they're not really sure where to go. There's a huge, huge disconnect between resources that these individuals and young people need and actually what they can access. So can they actually access child services to maybe talk about some of these family issues? Or do they want to? Can they actually access education services so that they're feeling like poverty is stricken? They go in, they're not having any lunch, they don't have to talk to, they're too embarrassed to talk to the teachers, and so on. And then what happens from this? If you have no one to talk to and you're, you know, you're going from this family environment that might be quite toxic, you can then go into your classroom and you're then feeling isolated again, you start acting out. So you don't want to sit down and listen, you've got the weight on your shoulders in the back of your mind. All of a sudden, you start misbehaving and you're starting to get labelled as the naughty kid at school. You're getting kicked out of your classrooms. It only takes off to be kicked out of the classroom before suddenly you're kicked out of school. So what happens then? You've got this person from a toxic family environment that's actually pushed back into that. At the same time, they don't want to be there, so they're out on the streets. They could turn to who knows what. And really, we need to prevent that at the beginning, giving them the correct resources, the correct knowledge to know how to drive their behavior and also to know how they can uh, communicate with others with any issues they may have. So we've got to think about that. And surely a solution can be found to assist with this communication where they may do some knowledge sharing and assign cases. Now, Tricia picks up on this really great app, which is but it looks like a frog and a unicorn combined. So I think we said it's a frog and corn, so that's pretty cool. And what, it, what you can do here, is you can ask questions. So in this case, we've got, hey, I'm Jolly. And it might be a question, hey, you know, hey, Jolly. And they go, oh, hey, how are you doing? Well, I'm feeling a bit down today. Oh, why is that? And you start taking them on a journey. And depending on which route they go, then say, oh, I'm worried about my mum. She doesn't have much money. And she keeps worrying about how we're going to pay for food. All of a sudden, you might have resources from your local council that say, you know, there's money there for you. You know, there's some support here. Well, have you tried bringing these numbers? And that can also be a case that once it gets to that level, Maybe some emails go out to the mum or maybe a text if they don't have access to the internet. Once again, the audience is key here. So yes, it is a kid, but some of these issues are much more severe than that. Now there is, a, it occurs to me, there is an added issue here though. When we're starting to talk about abuse and family issues, you kind of have to categorise what they are. Because if the issues with the family, the last thing you want is a text going to the family. Because then all of a sudden, this chat with Johnny probably gets taken off the phone. They don't even know about the issues they've got to know. So all this you've got to think about. That is perfect. Oh, yes. Very <laughs> right. good today. Let's see what we got the last time. Right. Information dissemination solution. I know it sounds sounds great, right? So, <laughs> older people living in deprived areas of black or minority ethnic groups or aged over 85 years are recognised as hard to reach. And what we mean is actually hard to reach to give information to. So we're all connected. You know, I've got. That five phones pointing at me now, I'm sure they're being streamed somewhere with. Um, but you know, we're all connected to the internet mainly. We have the world's biggest pool of information in the palm of our hands that not everybody does. So the ability to share information rapidly, efficiently, and directly from these community hubs, I mean there's around nine community hubs, but remember when we build applications and solutions, they have to be scalable. Because what starts off at nine could be 18 a couple of years later, it could be more and more of what I hope there is. And then what happens is these community hubs need to reach out to the community members but in a way that the community members can interact. So at the moment, community leaders within these hubs will get their information from various sources. So let's look at that. This could be the NHS going, hey, flu season's around the corner. Do you know we can actually get some, uh, some flu vaccines out? They go, fantastic, I best go and tell everybody. What do I do? Do I stand on a box in the middle of town and start shouting? Do I go to the local mosques and church and spread that way? It's always hard to get everybody with all this very same information. The same with local government, maybe there's a change in uh, coronavirus support, all of a sudden you've got to wear masks in retail shops, but you've walked two miles, I don't drive, so I walk to the shops, if I walked all the way there, then found out that I had to wear a mask and I left back at home, I'd be fuming. So there's one aspect, and also the community itself feed information back. 
Now I'm going to ask Alex to do a few more examples on this moment, but let's get through the, uh, the rest of it. So the whole idea is to be able to feed information out and also take that information back in. So sharing this information, disseminating it to those who need this, is a logistical nightmare. I've just said, how do you push that information quickly? And then also getting that information back is also just as hard. So there's an easy solution here. I know the guys are the power platform guys in this room, that's what you are now, you're all power platform guys. Uh, and the people on the camera go, well, that's easy. If you're a model driven app, you can then have a to, to process the information, the canvas app, those out in the field collecting the information. Oh, well, what do you like to tell me? Okay, yeah, it's going to go back to the central hub. And then you can push it out via a public facing portal. Very simple, just a little website saying, hey, here's the latest news. However, there is a catch. As stated, not many of the community members have easy access to things such as apparently people with the internet. They don't have access to that. So maybe we could use some sort of tech service. Who knows? I can't give away the answers. But Malik, this, I know this sounds very close and something you're really focused on. So, so community hubs, you'll know what they are. And we work with them. Churches, mosques, temples, football clubs, all the hubs and the networks that we all know and we all, we all go to. So those are the hubs who are better placed to give information out. So how do we create these loops between us and the community hubs and to the, the wider population? But one important thing is that when public policy is being developed, very, very few B and D people fill in forms. Very few people feed back to public uh, public policy um, information. So therefore, the people who are making decisions actually don't know what people in the communities think about. So therefore, it's two ways: how do you get information out to B and D communities, and how do B and D communities feed information back in? to public policy or back into us at the centre. So therefore we can say these are the concerns of Pakistani people or African Caribbean people or African people. How do you create those loops of information out and information back in? Anyone got the answer? <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to well, I'm very conscious of time. We've, we've got over so I'm going to really race through these last slides. So a big aspect of today is to ensure people know the great work that's happening here. So please, Black Lives Matter Hack 2020. It's a bit of a long hashtag, but writing BMF, it might not hit everybody, they might not all be aware of what that is. So let's try and go with Black Lives Matter Hack 2020. Post on Twitter, post on LinkedIn. Uh, we are tagging in, we are TPG on the LinkedIn, we are TPG to keep track of these at the so we can then amplify it to other networks as well. And I know that Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, the social media streams will also be able to amplify this for us. So if you want to get pictures about the, the hashtag, and please be aware, I will send these uh, slides out, or at least the solution ideas that you have access to. I'll do that straight away. So introducing the people you need to Brian. We have Keegan Stanty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we got it went up, we got it. We got it. Alec Gull, sitting in a room with us. We have Janet Rob, she's a legend, and I know she's one of your mentors as well. Mark Abara, who we just heard about, a uh, fantastic story. And then we have hopefully Anna Emily. I she wasn't going to do a bit of a speech earlier, but there's been a bit of a complication there, so I hope she can join us a bit later. Um, just to race through this, sponsors, we got uh, Mimitech, Mel, and Tarch. Everybody else is doing as well. Uh, so, 